Okay, so now okay. it's, it's recording. recording. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go on with the um, business about um, the corruption of the photon propagated known as vacuum polarization. And um, I'll also remind you of a few things, um, namely that uh, L here is minus uh, a quarter F and um, so it's it's written initially in terms of quantities that I described as um, uh, well, let's see, I keep forgetting to do this capital letter um, in terms of what are called bare quantities so B stands for bare and um, we can then break this up into the standard uh, the standard uh, things and um, in particular we can write this as L0 plus L1 plus L2 and um, L0 is just the standard Lagrangian that we that for the free non-interacting theory minus a quarter FAB, FAB, um, minus psi bar, uh, D slash plus M psi. Um, L1 is minus IE, AA, psi bar, gamma, A psi. And then L2 has all these counter terms that we're going to use to cancel infinities. And um, I'll just write down, this is all on the class web page latex, um, plus dot, dot, dot. The only term we're going to use today is this one. Um, and last time, I um, showed you that the second order amplitude or well, the correction of the photon propagator, or well, the second order of contribution to this amplitude, time ordered product of uh, E squared integral AA of X psi bar X gamma A psi X A B Y psi bar y gamma b psi y uh, times uh, d fourth x d fourth y and I guess I should put q s here. So that's that's the amplitude and we worked out what it was um, last time <clears throat> and um, in particular we, we renamed it pi star AB to conform with Weinberg's usage of Q and this is minus I e squared over 2 pi to the fourth the Feynman trick gives us integral 0 to 1 dx, and then we have d fourth p, and then we had a huge trace. And um, the trace turns out, I'll just write down the value of the trace. It's 4 minus p plus x cubed a, p minus 1 minus x cubed b, and then the same expression, p plus 
x cubed b b minus 1 minus x cubed a, and then both of those terms um, plus p plus x cubed dotted into p minus 1 minus x cubed a to a b. So that's the numerator, and the denominator is actually simpler in a sense. It's p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon plus x, 1 minus x, p squared squared. So that's after the Feynman trick. And um, anybody starting? Why do you have a question? Yeah, so uh, something that I wanted to ask was is, so you're saying that what, we're ca what we had calculated was a correction to the Feynman propagator for the yeah. photon. And so that propagator would have been if we didn't have interaction with the Dirac fields? Or Just beta A to A, B over Q squared minus I epsilon. Okay, I'm sorry to say that. Well, a it's, a B the, the, the zero order is so. essentially A to A, B over Q squared minus I epsilon. Oh, you're saying if we would have just calculated the, the zeroth order term from this? Well, the zero order term is just, um, well, just as a, 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 B with no size. Okay, yeah, sure. And that's... that's it's the thing we discussed last sure. semester. And so then why do they call this vacuum polarization? One more why thing. do they call this vacuum polarization? Oh. The idea is that um, is that you can have positron anti-positron pairs. Oh, like on the diagram, you have this one. Pull, uh, going down. Pop out of the back. Yeah, I see. The, but what we're doing is we're saying there's the propagator, and then. This is the correction that we're calculating. And of course, there are also other corrections. For example, and so forth. Okay. And um, it turns out that if you write down, I mean, there also there are other terms. But if you just write down these terms, where this thing is that, yeah. then you can sum them. And the thing is basically, it's basically that divided by 1 minus Okay, so in other words, it's this plus this plus this squared plus this cubed and so forth. Sure. And the sum of that is, is, is that. So this thing is a correction to the, it adds a term that corrects the mass of the photon. In fact, what I should say is it's Q squared minus that. So, so that's basically what, what we've got here. Um, any other questions? Just, all right. So let me um, let me repeat what uh, the wick rotation so that's, that's what I'm going to do now. The wick rotation is, and um, I had a, a sign off last time. What we do is we're going to set P0 equal to IP4, and we're going to integrate P4 from minus infinity to plus infinity. So in other words, in this P0 plane, the original integral is along the real axis, but there are poles due to the fact that p squared um, can be uh, negative as well as positive, and there's x1 minus x and q squared and so forth. 
So there are poles, and these poles are here and here. And so what you can do is you can basically add a ghost contour here that's actually zero, another one there that's a ghost contour, and convert the thing to an integral up the imaginary axis. So P0 then um, is I P4, where P4 goes from minus, P4 just runs along the real axis. So when you do that, what happens is uh, P dot Q becomes P dot Q plus P4 Q4 because the, the minus sign in the Lorentz product gets canceled by the two I's. And... Wait, sorry, can I ask a question about the contour that you drew? So the... Hold on, hold on. Okay. What now? The, do the residues lie outside of this enclosed curve that you've mentioned here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, so the, the poles the, are the, here, yeah, the poles. and what you do is you add a ghost contour here, which is oh, zero, and yeah, so yeah. this integral and that integral yeah, yeah. are equal. Sorry. Yeah. This integral... Well, the whole thing is zero. No, you're, you're right. You're anyway, the, 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 the this integral and that integral Zero. Well, it's really this integral and that integral, I guess, are equal. Anyway, what happens is uh, you don't you just swing this down, and you don't the poles just lie outside the the, the relevant area, which is here. Okay, so when when you've done that, what we're talking about here is pi star ad of Q, and this could be thought of Q, Q0, where Q0 is real, or it can be thought of as um, pi star AB of Q, I, Q4. Um, I'm just a little puzzled now. Um, yeah, Q4 being minus I Q0. Um, anyway, the, the result is that this, um, Up here, because of these dot products become Euclidean, and this is called Euclidean space effect, effectively, um, because all the integrals then are all the dot products. There are no no uh, no Lorentz minus signs anymore, and we can drop the i epsilon at this point. And so what we have is that this is equal to four e squared over. 2 pi to the fourth, integral 0, 1 dx, integral d fourth p sub e, meaning we just are integrating just p1, p2, p3, p4, all go from minus infinity to plus infinity, they're real. And what we have then is minus uh, p plus xq a p minus 1 minus x q b and then the same thing b a and then uh, plus p plus x q dot p minus 1 minus x q now this is delta a b and all this is now divided by p squared plus m squared plus x, 1 minus x, q squared. Okay, so now um, when we do this integral on all the p's, everything here is positive. We're thinking of q squared as being positive. Um, uh, q squared in any case is q vector squared minus q zero squared 
But um, since we're letting Q0 square, Q0 be, um, we're letting Q0 be imaginary also, so this is just uh, Q1 squared plus up to Q4 squared, so this is uh, positive or at least non-negative. What is the what is the subscript on your? Where's the what? The subscript on P. Oh, the E. E you put in. Uh, and then your denominator is that square? Say so just like before. Right? Yes. Well, thank you. Yes, that's an important correction. Duh. I can get two direction. Okay, so this is a badly divergent integral. In fact, it is quadratically divergent. So, um, since the 1970s, the choice way of regularizing this uh, this kind of integral has has been dimensional regularization. Now, let me first of all say that even to get to this point, we had to use Feynman's trick of originally, you see, that we had two fermion propagators, which meant we had a product of denominators. We used the Feynman trick to write that as a, as a square of a sum of denominators. But in order to then shift P to P plus XQ, I think that was the shift. Um, in fact, you can see that was the shift because we have P plus XQ everywhere. Uh, in order to do that, we had to first make the integral convergent. So the idea is we first make the integral convergent, then we um, then we do Feynman's trick, shift P, and uh, do the wick rotation and so on. Even the wick rotation, these things aren't ghost contours with this integral. They're diverging. But um, we imagine that we've already made the thing convergent. Now, the, now the making the thing convergent is two steps. One is we, um, sub we use these counter terms to subtract infinities. But subtracting infinities is a dicey game. So what we first do is we change the nature of this integration so as to make the integral finite. Then we put, we'll put in the counter terms and subtract. And then once we put in the counter terms and subtracted, we can then uh, relax the dimensional regularization. So the dimensional regularization is to take this number four here and write it as d. And uh, now this integral converges in the complex d plane as long as d is not equal to 2n, where n is an integer, positive integer, a natural number. So as long as d not equal to 2, 4, 6, and so forth. And of course, we're not worried about 6 and 8 since we're not doing string theory, but um, we are worried about 4. Um, and uh, notice that we can imagine that D is complex. And in fact, that's what we'll do. We'll imagine that D is some complex dimension. So this converges throughout the complex D plane, except that the, it has poles at the, at the even integers. So we imagine that we did that way, way back here, and that's why we were able to do Feynman's trick, and that's why we were able to do the width rotation. Okay. So we've got something finite, but in order to let D go to 4, we have to bring in the counter term. Now, for dimensional regularization, you see what you, the reason why dimensional regularization works is that after the Feynman trick, um, these denominators are very simple. This is just a function of piece of the radius of 
in peace space, uh, in whatever dimension we're ha we happen to work with, and then these are just terms linear, quadratic, and Q in P, and other uh, variables. And um, so the first thing is to compute the area of a unit sphere in D dimensions. And this turns out to be 2 pi to the D over 2 divided by gamma of D over 2 where, of course, the gamma function is also defined unless d happens to be an even positive integer. Let me, let me derive this for you. Uh, the derivation is it's almost as though the only integral we can do is a Gaussian integral. We're going to do this Gaussian integral two different ways. The first way is in rectangular coordinates. So then it's integral minus infinity plus infinity e to the minus x squared dx raised to the power d. Well, we know that this integral is pi over 2, uh, not pi over 2, root pi. So this is root pi to the d or pi to the d over 2. So that's where this term comes from. On the other hand, we can do this integral in spherical coordinates, and then the integral is going to be the area of the unit sphere times an integral r to the d minus 1 dr, sorry, e to the minus r squared. Uh, and that is just a sub d times one-half gamma of d over 2. So this is basically the closely related to the ordinary definition of the gamma function. Okay, so now what are we going to do? Well, we've got things like PA and PB. So when we do this integration where the denominator is just, just involves the squared radius in D dimensions, this thing is going to be proportional to delta AB, the chronica delta. And um, the the uh, extra factor is going to be p squared, and then we divide by d. And um, so in other words, suppose d were 4, then um, if a and b are different, you get 0, because these would be odd and integrate to odd quantities. Um, if on the other hand, a and b are both equal to 1, say, then what we get is not all of p squared, but one quarter of p squared, and this gives you one. So that's that's how that works. Um, so, sorry, what, where does the delta a p come from? Again? Oh, it, it, if we're integrating with where the, the the integral is is a function of the integrand is a function of the radius squared, and then terms linear and or quadratic in P yeah. or constants and uh, if it's quadratic in P we're integrating over all of yeah. P space and so if this is one and that's two then this is gonna you're gonna integrate P one from minus infinity plus infinity you get zero. That's the idea. So then a lot of this thing simplifies and this thing becomes, in particular, 4e e squared a sub d, the area of the unit sphere in d dimensions, divided by 2 pi to the fourth integral 0 to 1 dx, integral 0 to infinity k to the d minus 1 dk. So I'm going to let k 
is the square root of p squared, which is to say square root of uh, one squared plus up to p d squared. And now what we've got is minus two k squared delta a b over d. 2QA to B, X1 minus X. But what I'm doing here is I'm following Weinberg in chapter, his chapter 11. And this is K squared minus X1 minus X, Q squared. All oh, that's delta AB. And then we have plus M squared. Well, hell, I could have stuck. Yeah, this I wrote this in a stupid way. Let me. Yeah. And then this is divided by. A squared plus m squared plus x1 minus x q squared squared. By the way, in the old days when people did these things with their fingers, the um, remember Sidney Coleman once said this would take um, half an hour, this could take a couple of hours, and then when you finally had this integral zero to one dx. You need me? No, did I, did someone say I needed you? You sent me an email. I sent you an email? So, like you didn't hear anything. I sent you an email, I sent you one. Uh, <laughs> but apparently you don't, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, I don't, I, I didn't mean to send you an email today. Okay. But hello. Hi. Hi, <laughs> everybody. That's good. That's great. That's good. That's By the way, we're very lucky to have him in the department. He's very, very kind. Somebody uh, had. Are there Russians? Do we have any Russian faculty? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what we, we're dealing with then. And um, it turns out, oh, I, I, I was saying something about these dx integrals. Sometimes one has dx and dy, sometimes even dx, dy, dz. And what Coleman said was that doing the dx, dy, dz integration, that could take a weekend. And of course, these days, if you have Mathematica, that kind of integral is very simple. It'll just do it for you. At least the simple ones I gave it, it did. On the other hand, I gave it these integrals, which um, are less trivial. and this is zero to infinity, this turns out to be a half c squared to the d over two minus two, gamma to the d over two, gamma to the two minus d over two. I gave this to Mathematica last night and I didn't get anything simple like that. But maybe I had to say assuming such and such. Anyway, k to the d plus 1 over k squared plus c squared squared dk. And this is uh, a half c squared to the d over 2 minus 1, it turns out, gamma of 1 plus d over 2 gamma of 1 minus d over 2. So we can use these integral formulas to do that integration, and then that will, um, by the way, here, c squared, of course, is um, m squared plus x, 1 minus x, q squared. 
Now, the famous identity for a gamma function is gamma of z plus 1 is z gamma of z. This is the remarkable property of a gamma function. And that gives us, that allows us to manipulate these. In particular, we can say that gamma of 2 minus d over 2 is 1 minus d over 2 gamma of 1 minus d over 2. And that gamma of 1 plus d over 2 is d over 2 gamma of d over 2. So let me just line there. And we can combine, we can use these two relations to relate these two expressions. And in particular what we can show is that this is 1 plus d over 2, gamma 1 plus d over 2 times gamma of 1 minus d over 2 is equal to 1 over 2 over d minus 1, gamma of d over 2, gamma of 2 minus d over 2. OK, and again, I need a little separation there. So if we use this relation, we can relate the bottom integral to the top integral. And in fact, this 1 over 2, minus 2 over d minus 1 cancels a term that shows up in the numerator when we apply these integral formulas. So let me first just say what happens when we apply the integral formulas. When we apply the integral formulas, what we get is pi star AB of Q turns out to be 2a, 2e squared a sub b over 2 pi to the fourth integral 0 to 1 dx, 1 minus 2 over d. This is the factor that this guy is going to cancel. Delta a, b, c squared to the d over 2 minus 1, gamma of 1 plus d over 2, gamma of 1 minus d over 2, and then plus 2 qa qb minus q squared delta ab x 1 minus x plus n squared delta AB, C squared to the D over 2 minus 2, gamma to the D over 2, gamma to the 2 minus D over 2. OK. So that's reduced now to a, an integral that um, Mathematica can do, or that in fact you and I can do. And if we now use these various gamma formulas that I've written down, we can simplify this to 2 e squared a sub d over 2 pi to the fourth. Combining the gammas, we get gamma d over 2, gamma 2 minus d over 2 integral 0 to 1 dx minus delta AB C squared plus 2 QA QB minus Q squared delta AB x 1 minus x plus m squared delta AB uh, B 
big square here, c squared from d over 2 minus 2. Okay. And if we now substitute for c, remember, c squared is this. We substitute for C, what we get is minus delta AB C squared plus 2QA QB minus Q squared delta AB X1 minus X plus M squared delta AB. This turns into 2QA QB minus q squared delta a b x one minus x. And so that means then <coughs> that pi star a b of q is now much simpler. It's four e squared a d over 2 pi to the 4th and the d over 2 gamma 2 minus d over 2 to a to b minus q squared delta a b and now an integral 0 to 1 dx x minus x m squared plus x 1 minus x q squared d over 2 minus 2. Okay, now this is a very nice formula because you see we recovered this expression that one finds when one does spin sums. You remember when we summed the polarization vector, we got something like that. But there's something even nicer about it, namely QA pi star AB of Q is zero because this is proportional to QA QA is Q squared QB minus Q squared QA delta AB QA, which is zero. So, the correction to the photon propagator satisfies a very simple equation, and that equation is a very important equation. And, it, and one of the reasons why people accepted something as fanciful and unexpected as uh, dimensional regularization is that it gave, a, it gave one this expression. Now why is this um, an important uh, expression and where does it come from? Well, it arises from two things. First of all, that um, electric current is conserved. In fact, this is probably the most so if we give this, say, the free field time dependence, it's automatically conserved and in more general context it's also conserved. The conservation of electric charge, of course, is it's not only very important, but um, it's physically, I think, the quantity, the conservation law that has been verified experimentally most accurately. It's because people really know how to deal with electricity. Uh, this current, of course, JA, is just psi bar gamma A psi. That's what current is. 
The other thing is that this current is neutral. So this is kind of, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put a zero here. So this is conserved. This is charge conservation. And this, and the current itself is neutral. Neutral in the sense that Psi, if we're talking about, and we are, we're talking about the, elect uh, the uh, electron-positron direct field, this lowers the charge by one, this raises the charge by one, and consequently it's neutral. So what, what's, what's the connection with the formula above for pi and... Ah, well, okay. yes, yes, that's what I'm about to do. Um, let me give you a candy for raising the issue because obviously that's a key thing. Um, so let's go back and recall what it is that pi is to begin with. And it's the pi star a, b, and q is apart from a fudge factor f. It's an integral d fourth x, d fourth y, zero time ordered product j a of x, j b of y times e to the i q y minus x. If you go back in the notes, which are online, by the way. Um, you see that at one stage we wrote this as factor this integral e to the i q y minus x and then these two j's time ordered product. So now let's, uh, let's compute this thing. And so if we write here q a What we do, of course, is we write here QA. But on the other hand, QA is I d by dx. So this is I f integral d fourth x d fourth y uh, zero, uh, sorry. Vacuum, let me just write this as ditto, and then this is dA, e to the i q, y minus x. So this qA can be written as a derivative acting on the exponential. I'm, of course, dropping terms at infinity because. Um, This won't work if I don't, and we'll always sort of, I don't know, there's a good reason, but I, I haven't thought of it in this context lately. Anyway, so um, we have, uh, it's this derivative here. Oh, actually, there isn't any need to integrate by parts yet. Now I'm going to integrate by parts this d by dA and have it act this way. And so what we then have is QA by star a b of q is then minus i f integral d fourth x d fourth y e to the i q y minus x and uh, d a now on time ordered product of j a of x j b of y So there I did integrate by parts, and um, what we're imagining is that we only care about physics somewhere near the laboratory and not out at spatial infinity, but temporal infinity. And uh, so these currents are zero and one. Uh, so now we differentiate. Well, when the derivative comes in here and hits the j, we get zero. So one term, 
I won't. Somehow I had a different I think in the notes there's a minus sign loose. Anyway, when this derivative comes in and hits the j, we get zero. But there's another term when it hits the time ordering, which is a theta function. So what we've got then is partial with respect to x uh, a, delta of x zero minus y zero, times j a x j b y plus delta y zero minus x zero j b y j a x. So what's left is that. Now, the in fact what we've got is 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 this entirely. And so when the j when this just hits the j we get zero here and we get zero there. What we're left with is the derivative on the delta on the theta function. I'm sorry, not delta function. Bad enough a theta function, not a delta function. Theta function, you know, is zero for positive values. I'm sorry. One for positive values, zero for negative values. So one side of the function is heavy, the other side is light, and it was in, invented by a man named Heavy Side. Curious idiot. Um, so this then gives us delta of x0 minus y0 times this, but here minus delta. And so this is delta of jx, ja of x, jb of y. And what's left over is an integral Um, actually, there isn't any d. There isn't any d cubed. Uh, there isn't any. All right. Sorry. Anyway, this is the extra term. Now, this term actually vanishes. It's an equal time commutator of j zero a with j b. The reason it vanishes is that um, J is the generator of uh, the symmetry that uh, gives us charge conservation. In other words, the, the U1 symmetry is E to the I Q, E to the I theta Q, say, where Q is an integral d cubed x j0 of x and some time t, but it doesn't matter because the thing is conserved. Um, and so this commutator is in fact zero if this thing is neutral. But this is neutral because, as I said, this lowers the charge and that raises the charge. So what we've got is that this vanishes because of current conservation and the neutrality of the current. And as I said then, this, uh, the fact that this complicated procedure of computing the correction of the photon propagator, making the integral finite gives, with dimensional regularization, gives us something that automatically satisfies this equation, this was um, a very positive development when it was first uh, discovered, which I guess was back in 1972 or so. What about the term where you differentiate J A of X? When it differentiate I mean, if you differentiate that expression that you have, you have D by DX of A of the theta function. Right, when we differentiate this expression, um, when it hits J A of X, we yeah. get zero. That's because 
Oh, that's the the current is conserved. The current is conserved. Okay. Then, when it hits the theta functions, it gives a commutator which vanishes because the current sure. is neutral. Sure. So that's the that's the story. Do you not get some like delta a zero? Like a has to be zero there. What? Oh, like a does does a have to be zero there because you have you're differentiating with respect to x a, but then you only hit well. A oh, that's that's. that's that's what you just said is brilliant. This is a zero. Because um, it's only the time derivative that makes a difference. And consequently, we have a zero. So this is d zero. Well, to start with, it's, it's dA. But the only one that counts is d zero. And we want it to be j zero because it's the charge that commutes with things. Right? All right, let me give you, uh, you get, you're going to be opening a candy store soon. Uh, I'll just add them to your Yeah, file. sure. <laughs> okay, so, so this is, um, this is a very nice expression. All right, now let me, Let's realize now, if we go back to this expression, which we said was so very nice because of this factor, um, uh, this term is going to be uh, divergent, and so is that one, because this is going to be gamma of 2, and this is going to be uh, gamma of uh, 0. So those two are divergent. And um, and uh, so we're going to bring in this uh, other term to to cancel, as I said before. And in particular, we realize that we have z minus z three three minus one over four. F uh, A B F A B. This is a term in L two that uh, we can we can bring in, and it contributes to pi star A B a term. Uh, let us say Z three of Q, which is minus Z three minus one Q squared delta A B minus QAQB. Yeah. Why is gamma of 2 divergent? Why is what? Gamma of 2 divergent. Isn't it? It's one factorial, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you're it's absolutely the right. Ones. Okay, the yeah. negative one is divergent. Yeah. Right, right. It's so gamma, gamma of zero. zero. This, this thing is gamma of zero, which is divergent. Right, okay. And you're absolutely All right. No, no, no. Brilliant, I, don't, I, don't brilliant, more candy. I don't need any more candy. Brilliant observation. Austin can have mine. You get, you get, you get, you get, you get, he said both of those were divergent rather than the other Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, it's, it's only this one. Not that one. Sorry. Do you have like a stack? <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do then is we add these two terms together. This term plus that term, and we use the z3 to cancel the divergent part. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to say we're going to write the total quantity pi star a b of q to be we're going to write it q squared delta a b minus q a q b times little pi of q squared. And 
a little pi of q squared is then minus 4e squared a sub d over 2 pi to the 4 gamma of d over 2, which doesn't diverge, gamma of 2 minus d over 2, which does, integral 0 to 1 dx, x 1 minus x, and now m squared plus x 1 minus x q squared, and this is to the power d over 2 minus 2. And minus z3 minus 1. All right, now the question is, um, how do we choose z3? Obviously, we're going to choose an infinite part of z3 to cancel the infinite part here, a finite part of this to cancel some of a finite part of this, and the question is what part? Well, to figure that out, we go back here to an earlier question, or my response to an earlier question, where I said that if we did a sum of these things, plus, in other words, all those terms, the infinite series, what we would get would be the ordinary propagator over q squared. Actually, I think I've got this. I wrote this, in, this thing symbolically in one in a silly way. So let me write this. I don't know. It's something like this. No, I think I had it right the first time. Anyway, it's a correction. It, this thing turns out to correct be a correction to the denominator of the photon propagator, and in particular. What we then get is that the photon propagator is q squared, and I guess it's minus pi star uh, little pi squared, I should say. Little pi, little pi of q squared. It's essentially that, and we don't want this thing at q squared equal to zero to be anything but zero, because that would be a mass term. Now, it could be a function of q that vanishes at q equal to zero. That would be OK, because that would mean the propagator was more complicated than just 1 over q squared. But the long-range property of the photon propagator is that it falls as 1 over q squared, meaning there's no mass. 1 over q squared with uh. So, for q, so pi of q squared has to be zero for q squared equal to zero. And um, so what we do here is we set z3 equal to 1 minus 4e squared ad over 2 pi to the fourth gamma d over 2, gamma of 2 minus d over 2, m squared to the d over 2 minus 2, integral 0 to 1, dx, x, 1 minus x. Of course, this is just a simple fraction. Um, so in other words, we force this to be 0. And uh, when q squared is 0, when q squared is equal to 0, this term goes away, and we just have this. And so essentially, this is just the term 0 equals pi of 0 just gives us this. So that tells us what z3 has to be. It gives us an explicit expression for z3. And now, uh, we can come back to this expression, which has z3 in it, substitute for z3, and we get uh, our essential uh, 
final, final expression for pi of q squared, and it is minus 4 e squared, squared ad. It's actually not the final expression, but it's equivalent to the final expression. In fact, I think it's equal to the final expression. It's canceled by this term here. And so let's write what this term actually is. Namely, what we have here is m squared plus x, 1 minus x, q squared to the d over 2 minus 2 minus m squared to the d over 2 minus 2. Well, what is that? Well, that is exp of p over 2 minus 2 log m squared plus x 1 minus x q squared minus, do I need, I need another parenthesis, minus exp Thanks, p over 2 minus 2 log m squared. Okay, now we can imagine we're letting uh, d go to 4, so this thing is going to 0. And um, so we expand these. The first term is 1 here, 1 there, and they cancel exactly. The next term is d over 2 minus 2 times log m squared plus x 1 minus x q squared minus d over 2 minus 2 log m squared. And now we can rewrite this as d over 2 minus 2 log m squared plus x, 1 minus x, q squared over m squared. And so this is d minus 2 over 2. Log uh, 1 plus x, 1 minus x, q squared over m squared. OK, so now. This factor here cancels this factor there. And unfortunately, I didn't write down a certain equation, but I brought um, a zero copy of Weinberg's notes here. And this term, gamma of 2 minus d over 2, well, this is 1 over. 2 minus d over 2 minus gamma plus higher order terms. And so d over 2 minus 2 gamma of 2 minus d over 2 is equal to um, minus 1 minus gamma. And everything else is zero because these are higher terms in 
2 minus d over 2. And um, now let me go back to my regular notes. And so then we actually find then that you get that gamma of 2 is 1. And um, what we finally find then is that pi of q squared is e squared over 2 pi squared equal to 0 to 1 x 1 minus x log of 1 plus x 1 minus x q squared over m squared yeah, so that's the final result, and um, you notice that if you let q squared go to zero, you've got log of one, which is zero, so pi, pi of zero is zero, and um, this then is um, is that. Well, let me first invite questions. I missed the point of the expansion of gamma. What was, what was the point of that expansion? The gamma of 2 minus d over 2? Did, where, did we use that anywhere? Good question. Um, so we've got, we're writing this as, this turns into minus 1 minus gamma. My question is what happened to minus gamma, because I don't see... Well, I think it's minus gamma times d over 2 minus 2. Oh, and then you're right. D and um, D so this is a typo in Weinberg. Weinberg. This is a typo in Weinberg. That makes sense, because... Then if d well, goes to no, 4... You're saying that it's... Well, but you multiply that whole thing by d over 2 minus 2 in the next line. Go down one line. Oh, that's right. When you multiply, this just gives you minus 1, and then this gives you 0. Right, 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 right. right. So I should have had here um, d over 2 minus 2, which is 0. Right. Okay, thank you. So that's just a minus sign. Right. Okay, so that's... Um, that's what what one gets, and uh, so this means that if let's just think about some of the things that this means. Weinberg goes on and describes um, uh, uh, many of the implications of this correction to the photon propagator. But notice when charged particles scatter, they can exchange one uh, photon. They can, of course, exchange two photons. But they can also exchange a corrected propagator. And in fact, whenever you have the ordinary propagator here, you might as well put in the corrected propagator. And consequently, the force between um, charged particles is uh, different. And um, the, the effect of it is that V of R between two charged particles, E1, E2, let me, let me get a better piece of chalk. Um, E1, E2 over by cubed, it's then an integral d cubed q e to the i q dot r of um, 1 plus pi of q squared, where this is just uh, the spatial q vector squared over q vector squared. So that's the correction uh, to the force between charged particles. Um, and um, the, the, 
this has been seen in various uh, cases, and in particular in um, the the 2S state of hydrogen, for example, um, is an energy shift of minus 1.122 times 10 to the minus 7 EV. And um, this is due to delta E over over Planck's constant, what I was saying, um, of minus 37.13 megahertz. And um, this is called the Euling effect. Um, it's small though compared to the Lamb shift, which is, which is um, in the opposite direction of um, 1.058 uh, uh, megahertz. So it's, it's um, something that is seen and has been, of course, verified in all kinds of um, atomic experiments. Um, and in fact, this is old hat in you know, these days because uh, this was first computed, I guess, with, it, it was probably computed in, late 1940s or in the 50s by Schwinger or Feynman or Tomonaga and um, uh, they didn't use dimensional regularization but I guess they used well Schwinger had an awful lot of they both they all three of them had a lot of experience and instincts and they they knew that however they regularized the infinities they wanted to preserve Lorentz invariance and gauge invariance. And that's essentially what dimensional regularization does. It just does it in a, a modern way, and a, a way that can be expended, extended to non-abelian gauge theories, whereas the, the this, of course, the abelian gauge theory and the, the Schwinger-Feynman-Tomonaga approach didn't work with non-abelian gauge theories. Okay, so I guess we can stop now. Let me 